So let's now move to the second second paper. Can supervisors enforce transparent accounting when the rules leave room for management discretion? Paper by Janis Bischoff, Ferdinand Elfers, and Nicholas Rudolph. Nicholas is presenting the, the paper. Yeah, thank you very much for the great opportunity to present uh, our work here today at the SSM uh, conference. This paper is a joint work with Janis Bischoff from the University of Mannheim, Fernand Elfers from the Erasmus School of Economics in Rotterdam, and uh, my name is Nicolas Rudolf. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Lausanne in uh, Switzerland. The paper is entitled, Can Supervisors Enforce Transparent Reporting When the Rules Leave Room for Management Discretion? And uh, this is uh, also exactly uh, conveying what we are trying to address in this paper, whether bank supervisors can change banks' reporting behavior to be more transparent when managers use discretion that is within the boundaries of the accounting rules. So usually when banks violate accounting rules, supervisors can react by issuing enforcement actions or sanctions to change banks' uh, behavior. Prior literature shows that these kind of formal enforcement actions help to improve uh, bank transparency. However, this is less clear when managers use discretion that is within the boundaries of the accounting rules, then supervisors often have not, have not the option to resort to these formal enforcement actions, but have to rely on more informal supervisory tools, such as the supervisory dialogues, um, to change banks' reporting behavior to align better with the supervisory reporting preference. This is uh, particularly relevant and interesting in uh, systems of dual supervision because there, as in the SSM, the supranational supervisor has to rely to a large extent uh, on the existing local infrastructure, on the resources of the local um, national competent authority. And this kind of cooperation between the ECB and the local um, national competent authority and the institutional characteristics, the local institutional characteristics are likely to shape how effective the supranational supervisor can implement its reporting uh, preference. Of course, an important issue here to address these uh, research questions is that supervisory reporting preferences are generally unobservable. So in our setting, we exploit that the ECB performed before the start of the SSM the asset quality review. And during this asset quality review, the ECB reassessed the audited financial statements of all banks that were later supervised under the SSM. And these results were also publicly uh, disclosed. And we now use these adjustments that the ECB made during the AQR to bank's loan loss provisions as our measure that captures the difference in the reporting preference between the ECB and the prior uh, local enforcement outcome under national uh, supervision. Important here to note is that the adjustments that the ECB made to uh, on loss provisions, for example, in the AQR, were in the majority not due to accounting violations. So more than 90% of these adjustments were not due to accounting infringements, but they reflected basically the ECB's opinion um, um, for a more conservative uh, reporting practice. Or more, yeah. So to wrap this up, what we want, want to do in this paper is to assess whether the change to supranational supervision and the simultaneous disclosure of supervisory reporting preferences changed, changed banks' reporting behavior, made banks' reporting more transparent, and whether this also changed uh, banks' uh, perceived market transparency. So I will keep the setting very brief because I think uh, all of you are uh, familiar with the SSM. Uh, so just. Uh, Briefly, in 2014, the ECB took over the uh, supervision of the most significant banks in the Eurozone, and significance was largely determined by size, 
So either the bank had to have more than 30 billion in assets or be, being among the three largest institutions in the country. So it's basically a country specific size cutoff. Another criterion was uh, the existence of significant cross border activity. So before the SSM, prudential supervision was mostly performed by the national competent authorities. There were already, yeah. Um, mechanisms in place uh, to facilitate cross-border banking supervision. However, this was much less formalized than um, after the introduction of the SSM. The ECB formally assumed the supervision of all banks in the Eurozone, but directly delegated back the supervision of non-significant banks to the uh, national competent authorities. Of course, as it was uh, mentioned already, the supervision by the ECB of the significant banks um, also relied to some extent on resources and infrastructure from the national competent authorities because supervision is uh, performed in these uh, joint supervisory teams that are headed by ECB staff, but that uh, also include staff from uh, national competent authorities. Yeah, the AQR was uh, an extensive balance sheet review it was a large reassessment of the financial statements of all banks that were later also subject to the SSM. More than 6,000 uh, staff were involved. The costs were 500 million euros approximately, and it took uh, almost uh, 12 months to complete this exercise. And the goal was to harmonize the measurement of banks' risk exposure and also to increase the quality of public information on these exposures. In the AQR, the ECB made adjustments to banks uh, with some of the reported numbers, such as loan loss provisions, collateral valuations, uh, classification of non-performing loans, and uh, also fair values. And these findings were uh, publicly disclosed. So here's an example how this disclosure on the bank level could look like. I mean, it's difficult to read because it's too small, but here you can see that the, the these adjustments were uh, broken down even by um, sector exposures. And then uh, at the end, there was uh, yeah, the total impact in euros uh, for tier one capital um, and in basis points presented. And this is exactly what we use in this uh, paper. We use this AQR adjustment made to loan loss provisions by the European Central Bank as uh, a measure that should capture the difference between the ECB's reporting preference on the one hand and the local uh, enforcement outcome under national supervision. Then we explore how the disclosure of this uh, reporting preference changes banks' reporting behavior, banks' reporting transparency, and also banks' uh, market uh, transparency. Under dual supervision, as I mentioned already, the ECB uh, is not uh, acting independently as a supervisor. The ECB relies to a large extent also on national competent authorities. And therefore, yeah, it is likely that the effectiveness with which the ECB can implement its reporting preference um, can depend on local political or local administrative factors that uh, uh, facilitate uh, or mitigate uh, cooperation between the ECB and the NCA. So what we have in mind here is, for example, if the institutional environment, the local institutional environment is relatively weak, the local supervisor has maybe uh, yeah, low uh, number of staff, has in the extreme maybe even a higher likelihood to be politically captured, then the supervisor was maybe even before the ECB took over the supervision, not able to enforce its preferred reporting practice so we expect a greater change in banks' reporting behavior when the ECB takes over uh, the supervision. So let me briefly explain our empirical strategy. So on a conceptual level, we are interested in how a change in enforcement and the simultaneous disclosure of the supervisory reporting preference changes banks' reporting behavior. Uh, and banks' uh, market transparency. On the operational level, we operationalize the change in enforcement with a dummy variable um, as a treatment here 
that takes the value of one from the year onwards uh, under which a bank is under uh, ECB supervision. And we also interact that with the AQR adjustment. This is the continuous adjustment made to the loan loss provision uh, scaled by the loan loss allowance um, to, the, to the bank. As dependent, variable, dependent variables, we use loss provisions, loss allowances. We also look at how uh, informative the loss allowance is ab about future charge-offs. And we look at uh, bid-ask spreads to proxy for market transparency. We use, uh, in our main specification, a classical difference and difference design where we use um, banks that were supervised uh, from uh, under supervision of the national competent authorities as our control group. We also include controls for size, capitalization. We try to uh, hold the risk profile uh, constant and uh, we control for cost efficiency. We include uh, year and firm fixed effects in our specification. So our final sample includes 102 uh, treatment banks that were under SSM supervision during our sample period. We exclude all banks that were not reporting according to I4S. We exclude banks that were uh, nationalized or that went bankrupt during our sample period. And our control uh, sample consists out of 612 uh, European control banks. And we include the criterion that this, uh, these control banks have to be at least as large as the smallest uh, treatment bank. In robustness tests that I cannot show today, uh, we also use entropy, balanced, uh, entropy balancing techniques, uh, matched samples, and also fuzzy RDD designs. The sample period spans from 2011 to 2017. And our data is unfortunately not as granular as in the paper before. So we have to rely on uh, bank data from Capital IQ. We use market data from ICON, and the AQR data is coming from the ECB. So in the first step of our analysis, uh, we look at whether there's any indication that the parallel trends assumption of our difference in difference design could be violated. So we look at um, whether there are anticipation effects here. So we plot basically the treatment effect relative to the introduction of the SSM for the respective uh, bank. So the SSM uh, was put into force in T0 here, and we see that there's no uh, indication that there's a anticipation uh, effect of the SSM, and the treatment effect uh, kicks in after the SSM introduction. So in our in regression with loan loss provision mean ratios as a dependent variable, we find that the SSM supervision um, led to a reduction in loan loss provisioning ratios by approximately uh, 0 0.2 uh, percentage points. However, for the banks uh, with larger AQRs, we observe less of, uh, of, an reduct of a reduction. So here the AQR is a continuous measure, so if we plug in the average AQR, which was 20.5% of uh, a bank's uh, loan loss allowance, so quite uh, substantial in magnitude, then we find that these banks were, uh, that had this kind of average AQR reduced their loan loss provisions uh, less by 0 0.35 percentage points compared to an SSM bank that had a zero adjustment. We find corresponding results uh, for the loan loss allowance here. In the next step, we look at the cross-sectional uh, variation in this, in this change in accounting outcomes. So as I said uh, before already, on the one hand, we look at the extreme, so national supervisors that are might, maybe more uh, prone to be politically captured. So we look at uh, factors such as country level forbearance or whether the government has high fiscal constraints or whether there's an NTU party in the national uh, government at the start of the SSM. And here we find that when the ECB steps in and takes over the supervision, it is more uh, effective in implementing its reporting preference. So we observe a greater change in, uh, in loan loss provisions here. On the other hand, if the prior local institutional environment facilitated uh, supervision already, so higher resources, higher government efficiency, higher regulatory quality, 
we find that uh, the shift to ECB supervision um, yeah, comes with smaller changes in banks' uh, reporting behavior. We also look at other factors that could potentially facilitate uh, cooperation between the NCA and the ECB, such as whether the NCA is a central bank supervisor, whether the difference in uh, the accounting standards, in the local accounting standards and IFRS is small, and here we fi also find uh, corresponding results. Of course, larger loan loss provisions do not necessarily imply that these loan loss provisions are more informative or more transparent. Um, so in the next step, we look at the association between the loan loss allowance and future charge-offs or future loss realization. And we find that uh, the loan loss allowances of banks where the ECB made larger AQR adjustments become more indicative of uh, future charge-offs. In the last step of our analysis, in the last step of our analysis, we look at uh, changes in bid ask spreads as a proxy for market liquidity. And what we find here is that uh, for banks, we can only do this for listed banks, of course, for banks where the ECB took over the supervision, we find an increase in market liquidity, so a decrease in bid ask spreads that is approximately uh, yeah, 16%. So quite substantial increase in market liquidity. The variable here is in log, so this is why this doesn't uh, correspond exactly to the coefficient. In the second column, where we include uh, the AQR effect, we see that this increase in market liquidity is solely attributable to these banks where the ECB expressed the preference for more conservative uh, reporting. So to conclude, we find that the shift to supranational supervision and uh, the simultaneous disclosure of uh, supervisory reporting preferences changed banks' reporting behavior. Banks with larger AQR adjustments also um, increased their loan loss provisions and loss allowances uh, to a greater extent um, compared to other SSM banks. In addition, the banks that uh, were subject to the greatest shift in institutional characteristics, institutional strength, and where the NCA has the li highest likelihood to um, cooperate with the ECB also exhibit the strongest increase in bank transparency. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion and uh, your questions. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Nicola. Uh, the discussion is Harry Husinga from Tilburg. Thank you. Discuss his paper today. And for that, I'd like to thank the conference organizers. So, <clears throat> this paper takes as a starting point the asset quality review adjustments, which the ECB published as part of its uh, comprehensive uh, assessment. And then the paper uh, sees how banks change their behavior following this publication. And then this nice paper finds <coughs> that higher AQR adjustments, uh, they led to uh, higher loan loss provisioning, they improved accounting quality, and then banks experienced greater stock market liquidity. <coughs> So then the main question is, uh, what could explain uh, these results? And here, the authors say that this is due to nudging by the ECB. And they say this is due to soft and informal actions to nudge. Now, there may have been some nudging, but this is difficult to check because most of the private communication to nudge is not observable to the researcher. <clears throat> so what I would like to do in my uh, discussion is go over some alternative explanations for these results, and some of these explanations can in fact be checked by the data. So there are three alternative explanations. One is that the ECB in fact did undertake some hard policy action in its supervision. Second, what may have been relevant is variation in supervisor, supervisory guidelines regarding loan loss provisioning, which could explain some of the results. And second, of course, there may have been market discipline, which occurred at the same time 
as a supervisory discipline. <coughs> so let's first uh, see what the ECB said itself about how it would uh, respond to uh, the results of the comprehensive assessment. So here what you see is a quote from the ECB's aggregate report on the comprehensive assessment. So if you read this quote, essentially the ECB says, yes, uh, the banks are free to uh, adjust their accounts if they want or not, following these AQR adjustments, but it's still true that the conclusions will be captured in ongoing supervision and in supervisory capital requirements, which suggests that there was going to be some hard follow-up. <clears throat> okay, so what channels would it then be for the ECB to have some hard policy follow-up? One avenue, I think, for the ECB would be to engage with the audit committee of the bank, which oversees the audit function at the bank. So one thing the audit committee needs to do is to draw up an audit plan and here, a recent supervision newspaper of the ECB says that a good practice is that the audit plan, it takes into account and follows up on findings of supervisory authorities. So this suggests there is this supervisory expectation that this happens, which could be part of hard policy. But it would still be not be observable to the researcher, unfortunately. But what I think would be observable is that there could have been changes in personnel. So were there changes in the composition of the audit committee, or perhaps of the, you know, the head of the audit function at the bank? So one thing the authors could do is look at you know, changes in personnel. Were they more prominent after large AQR adjustments? <laughs> so a second avenue for the ECB to affect outcomes is through capital regulation. So let me first talk about uh, P2 capital requirements. So the ECB could take uh, optimistic asset values as a risk factor, and then in response, it could increase P2 capital requirements. Now, if so, this would provide a direct incentives for banks to become uh, more cautious because then the P2 capital requirement would go down again. So I think if this were to occur, it would also be part of hard policy. But unfortunately, this channel cannot be checked because the P2 capital requirements uh, during the sample period, they were mostly not made public. And also the rationales behind these capital requirements, they, were, they remained confidential. <laughs> so secondly, uh, the ECB could uh, have acted uh, through the P1 capital requirement. And there's evidence in the paper by Hasselmann that the SSM uh, supervision, it led to generally higher risk rates at the affected banks. Now, why is this relevant? Because I think there has to be a consistency between the accounting and the regula regulatory approaches to dealing with threat of risk. So if uh, the regulatory approach becomes more stringent, so risk rates go up, then also the accounting approach should become more stringent and we expect loan loss provisioning to be more stringent. So there's actually some evidence that there is this correspondence. So there's a paper by Homar and Office, and they showed that the AQR adjustments were lower for banks, which were from countries with previously stringent capital regulation. So this suggests that these banks already had high loan loss provisioning and there was less of a need to adjust. And this channel, I think, actually can be checked by the authors because there is information on uh, post-SSM changes in average risk rates. So this could be taken into account, say, as a control factor in what they are doing. Now, another piece of policy is to provide guidance on loan loss provisions. And these are rules which set minimum loan loss provisions depending on the status of the loan. That is whether the loan is impaired or not. And these guidelines are important because they can supplement or even override accounting rules. And this may have been important because there could have been a variation in these rules in the pre-SSM period, which could explain some of the results. So let's say you're a bank from a country where previously you were subject to stringent uh, supervisory guidelines. Then already you had high loan loss provisioning ahead of time. So there would be little need for a high AQR adjustment 
or to increase flow mass division afterwards. So I think this is a channel which actually can be checked by the authors because there is information on the what's called provisioning stringency index, which is published by the World Bank on the basis of its uh, uh, regulatory and supervisory survey. So I think this would be a direct measure of uh, supervisory preferences, uh, which actually is more direct than some of the measures which the authors uh, use in the paper. And of course, the ECB itself is no stranger to supervisory guidelines on loan loss provisioning, because it issued, issued its uh, guidance on non-performing loans in 2017, which provided expectations for prudential provisioning of non-performing exposures. And that suggests that the SSN period actually is not uniform, because the year 2017 could have been different from, say, 2015 and 2016. So a final issue I'd like to mention is the issue of market discipline, which could have occurred at the same time as regulatory supervisory discipline. So there are papers that show that the AQR results had market consequences, and specifically uh, share prices on average for the affected banks, they fell. And I think there are two reasons why share prices could have fallen. One is that investors were disappointed about the level of the AQR uh, adjustment. So asset values, in fact, were lower than they had anticipated. But the second reason why markets could have reacted is that they understood at that point that accounting values actually were less informative than they had thought previously. And this then provides an incentive for banks to act, right, to, to regain credibility, then the share price would go back up. So one of the things they could do, for instance, sorry, for instance is to uh, affect the composition of the audit uh, committee. So then we get to a situation where market discipline could have led to some of the same responses uh, as discussed as regulatory discipline. So then the question is, how can we actually you know, separate supervisory versus market discipline? And here it helps that, as uh, mentioned, I think, by the uh, author, uh, by Nicolas, is that not all banks have a stock market listing. And uh, the paper by Carboni that looks at market reactions only had 50 stock market listed banks in the sample. This suggests that for various reasons, some banks do not have stock market listed, listed uh, listing because say they are cooperative banks. And this is relevant because one expects the, uh, the market discipline to be more prominent, at least through the stock market, for banks that have a stock market listing. So this information could be added into the framework. So uh, uh, for instance, the Loan loss provisioning response could be bigger following previous AQR uh, adjustment publication uh, because that then there would be supervisory as well as a market uh, discipline response. So in summary, I think it's a very nice paper that looks at some of the changes in bank behavior which uh, were in response to the AQR results. But I think there are several explanations that go beyond the nudging explanation which is favored by the authors. And unfortunately for the authors as empirical researchers, uh, some of these alternative explanations, they can be uh, confronted with additional data. Many thanks, Harry. So it's time now to open the floor for interventions from the audience. Please, go ahead. Mm. Uh, Klaus Zimmern from the ECB. Um, I have one question or suggestion, if it makes sense for you also to extend the sample by looking at banks that not only entered the SSM in 2014 with a big acquire, but also look at those banks that became significant institutions in the following years and also had to go through an acquire, but are they not subject to the specificities of the situation in 2014? And that will actually strengthen your, your argument. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the presentation, very interesting paper. I'm uh, interested in how you form your treatment and control groups. If I understood correctly, uh, you require that uh, the control banks have the same size as uh, the, the smaller uh, treatment banks. And my concern goes as follows. Like I know from Greece, we have like four systemic banks that uh, 
were supervised in 2014, and very tiny banks that are not part of the system. So I assume that you include the four systemic banks into your uh, treatment group, and you include no control banks from Greece in your sample. My second concern is like if you include the systemic banks of Greece that are like small compared to the German banks, this opens the door to include a lot of like non control uh, banks like small banks from Germany. So essentially what you're gonna compare is like the small banks in Germany with the systemic banks in Greece. And this control group will also be compared with the large banks in Germany, right? So I have like these concerns uh, with regards to your uh, methodology. Thank you. Thanks for the for the paper. So in the previous paper, we saw that after the SSM, banks cut lending to risky firms. But then at the same time, you showed that there's an economically significant increase in provisions for risky loans, kind of. So could you like try to reconcile how these two effects could coexist? Okay, why don't you try to respond? Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for all your questions. Very well taken, all the points. Um, I will uh, try to start with the uh, extension of the sample period. So. Maybe this was not uh, super clear in my presentation, but in our current setup, we include all banks that were subject to the SSM in 2014, but we also follow up with the uh, banks that were included in 2015 and 16 that also had uh, an AQR assessment. So, but we also try different uh, analysis, including these banks or removing them from our sample and uh, the, the results are essentially the, the same. Yeah. But uh, thank you for this uh, good question. Then the second question about uh, yeah, comparability of the control group in terms of size. So the criterion that um, we apply here comes from another uh, research paper from uh, RFS that was published in RFS. And basically, this criterion is that uh, the control banks have to be at least as large as the smallest treatment bank. So, but of course you're right. I mean, the significance uh, criterion is basically a country specific size cutoff. So there is naturally this uh, concern that control banks uh, in Greece that are small are may, or that are still big in Greece are compared to small banks in, uh, in Germany, for example. So this is why we also try um, other research designs that are maybe less prone to these uh, issues such as fuzzy RDD where we then really compare apples with apples and not uh, apples to oranges. But uh, it is relatively difficult because at this country specific size threshold, uh, yeah, there are not that many uh, banks to identify. And this, this then weakens, of course, our external, um, or, yeah, our external validity or generalizability of our results. So this is why in our main test, we try to rely on this uh, difference in difference specification where we then can also provide a little bit more color on the, the uh, cross-section of the uh, effects, yeah. Um, yeah, regarding the third question, uh, how can we reconcile uh, that SSM banks cut their lending to risky borrowers, but at the same, same time, banks with larger AQRs uh, increase their provisions? Um, that's a good question. Um, I have to think about it uh, more to, to answer it uh, thoroughly, but um, in the baseline, the SSM effect is uh, negative. So if you think about a bank with a zero AQR adjustment, these banks uh, reduce their loan loss provisions by 0 0.2 uh, percentage points. And then only the banks where that had larger AQRs increased provisions relative to these uh, banks, uh, other SSM banks that had zero, zero adjustments. So um, yeah, we have to check, check more. I mean, one potential alternative explanation would be that this uh, reflects a change in, in the risk taking. We try to control for risk taking. We do some additional tests um, that I didn't present whether 
uh, risk-taking change around the SSM, and we didn't find any evidence that this um, changed uh, our results. But um, yeah, I have to look at this in in, in, in greater detail. Yeah. Many many thanks, uh, Nicolas. Many thanks, uh, Harry.